We're going to look at fantasy basketball settings. What's right? What's wrong? What can we do to change it? And a bit of a preview of the NBA's playing games. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I was going to win the Podcast of the Year awards. Unfortunately, out of the 600 podcasts that I did, 100 of them were under one hour, so I was ruled ineligible. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter, as always, at RedRock underscore Beeble, on TikTok at RedRock underscore Beeble, and on Instagram at LockedOnFantasyBasketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. If you've got a competitive side, get involved with Monopoly Go. It's the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. And we are available on all platforms. So all of you people who are looking for something to do now that the NBA season's over, why don't you why don't you double bang it? Like that's a great way of helping out. Watch the video, listen to the audio, thumb up, bell, all of that stuff. It's a great way to help out the show. So we're here. Um, a little bit later in the day today, the what I was hoping to do anyway, you don't really care that much about that. But we are here to talk about Just some things that I found out, just easing our way into our off-season program, talking about settings across fantasy basketball, and at the end of the show, a look at the first batch of play-in games before we get into my full playoff predictions later on this week and awards and all that sort of stuff. So that's what we're going to get get into uh, very, very soon. Um, Let's talk fantasy basketball. Let's talk settings. I did this show about 12 months ago, and I talked about... The things that I've been working on for a few months, probably a month or so, let's let's be fair, um, about trying to fix stuff in fantasy basketball. Not that it's bad, that it's broken. That just, there are ways to uh, optimize this game because the way that fantasy basketball has been set up is copying a lot of other fantasy sports. It's copying fantasy football. It's copying stuff in fantasy baseball. And while there are a lot of ways that we can do things the same, it's not... It's not the same thing. There are differences in the way the games are played. There are differences in the categories. There are differences in the sport, in the league, and all that sort of stuff. And some of the things that frustrate people the most are due to some of those differences. So I went about trying to create a league that I thought should, it never will, but should be able to lean into something that amounts to the perfect way to play a head-to-head fantasy basketball league. Not perfect. It's never going to be perfect, but... An, an optimal way to bring us the best enjoyment, to eliminate some of the issues that are challenging, and to I don't know, just make the game more more um, fair, engaging, competitive. That's, I think, what we all want. We want fun. We want it to be competitive. We want it to be engaging. We don't want it to be unbalanced. And that's what I set about doing. So I want to go back and look at those changes that I made through the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Ball. We tried it out. Like, there was... Um, 90 different leagues that we ran these settings in. And we ran a hybrid of them in industry pickup as well. So we got a decent sample size to see how it went. And we're going to talk about that. And I'm going to talk about some other ideas that I have had throughout this offseason. Nowhere near as dramatic. Well, actually, that's not true. Nowhere near as I think this solves the problem. I think what I did with Locked On Fantasy Basketball Ball and the settings fixed... Let's say I think it fixed 85 to 90% of the problems that exist in fantasy basketball. Humbly, I'm a very, very humble man. I think it fixed 90% of the problems. The next part that I'm going to talk about, or the, the other things I'm trying to change, might it might actually not improve it. It might make it slightly worse, but it could push an extra 5% forward. So it's not as big of a deal. We definitely want to in- implement all of these things in the new changes through the bowl next season. It'll be more tweaking on what I feel now is an established default baseline. There are a couple of things I want you to do as you sit here and listen to me talk about this stuff, is that challenge your own preconceived ideas. We never change. We never innovate. We never move forward. If we just go, 
I actually like it. This is what we've always done. This is how it's always been. It's how it always has to be, right? There are a lot of you that will have that mindset. Even when we, I talk about the survey results that I sent out for Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowl, and we got over a quarter of the people responding back. So a pretty decent sample. When people added extra comments in, some of them were just like, yeah, but I, I, want, I want it to be like the old style. <laughs> because oh, that's what I know. That's how fantasy is. And the only reason you know that's what fantasy is is because when you started playing fantasy, that is how the settings were. So that's what you got used to. That is what everyone defaults to talking about because that's what the default is. And this might be a 20-year mission for me to go ahead and make these changes become default. So that when we do start talking default, we're at a spot where I don't have to make a million tweaks to make things right or make things better or more enjoyable. So challenge your ideas. When you, when, if you haven't heard of these or if you haven't played it, challenge your ideas. Because your ideas will say, um, streaming's a uh, huge part of fantasy basketball. Got to have it. No, some of you will say that. Yep, I've got no doubt that some of you will say that. Um, I need to have extreme action on the waiver wire. Okay, why? Well, because that's just what you've done. Challenge it. Challenge the ideas is what I would say to you in that scenario. So let's have a look. What did we actually do? What did I change? How did it work? The first thing that I did, or what? Not what I, I can't tell you actually the order that I did them in, but one of the things that I did was I changed the roster size. It is ridiculous to me that the default roster size for fantasy basketball is 10 starters and three bench players in a 12-man league, which is 156 players. The NBA has 540 roster spots. There are 576 players that played in a game this season. Now, you don't want to, necess- you don't want to have 500 players rostered, of course. We are talking, though, Basically, a standard fantasy league rosters a quarter of the league. That is just way too small. And the the gap or the ratio between starters and bench is off. Nearly all of you that play fantasy basketball that are American, maybe Europeans, Australians, not, not, not necessarily, but if you are American and you play fantasy football, one of the big things that you do is like handcuffs or you have a bench. And you stash a guy here and you wait and see. You don't have... I don't even, don't even think that off the top of my head how many starters you have in fantasy football. What do you have? Two running backs, two receivers, a flex, a quarterback. You might have nine starters, right? Ten. Let's say it's ten starters. You don't have three on the bench. You got five to six. And yes, the league is slightly bigger, but half of the side of the, of the game doesn't play. You don't play defense, defenders. You don't play all the offensive players. There are five offensive linemen on a field in an NFL game, obviously. So there are six skill players. Six times 32. It's 192 players that you can even choose from in that player pool. And I'm not here to tell you that the 576 NBA players are worth using, but there are 10 guys who see the court for a level of minutes every night for every team. That's 300 players. Even if we use the, the top seven guys, who you probably get 23 minutes a night at least. That's getting to the equivalent of football, but the ratios are all, all whack. So what I did is I bumped it big. I went 10 starters with eight bench. I hate the scenario, and I've said this before. I don't like the scenario where you're squeezed into a spot where you've drafted well, and you get four guys out for three weeks at once, your top four picks, and then you cannot win those weeks, A, your best players are up. You can't even try to recover because you have to then make the decision, well, do I I drop Joel Embiid? Right? Do I drop Joel Embiid? Do I drop Carl Anthony Towns? Do I drop Tyrese Halliburton when he was injured? Because you just don't have enough roster spots because basically in fantasy basketball, every single one of your roster spots gets used all week. It gets used all the time. And that is stupid. It's your your team, your roster, your bench is basically just everyone is gets used at all points, which is a silly way to approach it. So I made the benches bigger. This is where some people had some gripes. They were like, no, nah, you got to make it sh- shallow. There wasn't enough waiver wire activity. 
I I actually dis I disagree. I disagree there wasn't enough waiver wire activity. They go, you never find enough players off the wire that are good enough. Again, I completely disagree. We found I found so many players available off the wire uh, in that league. Or you can just you can talk about it now, but just think about the names that that stepped up and started to play play well at the end of the season. Throughout the season, like so many guys were not drafted and had very very strong fantasy years. If I just look at the division I was in, the main red clause for the category league in one of ninety different leagues, we had like 700 waiver wire transactions in that league. Dante DiVincenzo was added off waiver wire. Um, Rui Hachimura was added off the waiver wire. Alex Caruso was added off the waiver wire. Um, let's go through so Xavier Tillman, who was the starting center at the beginning of the year, was added off the waiver wire. Uh, Alec Burks, when he's running Detroit, Tim Hardaway was added off the wire. Nikhil Alexander-Walker was added off the wire. Um, Grayson Allen was added off the wire. Um... These are all just within the first week of the season as well. Uh, uh, Nahomi Hakez was drafted, my, my mistake. But that's just within the first week of the season. We had like over 700 transactions. And you see names there that are very, very comfortable top 100-ish sort of players who produced you know, really good numbers. Harrison Barnes ended up being added off the wire at one point. There's just so many different names that you could find. out Again, maybe you don't find a top 100 guy, but you could have. Pajemski. Kaminga, these guys were added. Jackson Davis. There were so many players who you can still find. I don't understand 100% the appeal of like, well, I've got to have this active waiver wire where good players get dropped and it's a mad scramble. To me, I don't think that's the, the value of fantasy. It's building a strong team, not being forced into a decision where you have to drop someone. Otherwise, your season's over. And that makes another team stronger. They added this unbelievable guy off the waiver wire. So I like the extra bench. And look, 82% of the people who replied to the survey, 276 people overall, uh, approved of it. They thought it was a really good idea. Now, we could quibble about whether 10 plus 8 is the right number and whether you do or 10 plus 8 and then have just one IL slot. Because in the end, we ended up having three IL slots. So it moved to 21 roster spots, which probably was too big. I, I do understand that. But the 10 by 3, the 10 with 4 bench, not it's no good. It's too small. It doesn't reflect reality. And it creates an unbalanced competitive environment. Today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. We all love to get things off my chest, much like I'm doing here. The NBA regular season's over. So I'm just spewing forward some thoughts about fantasy basketball, the settings we use, the way we approach the defaults, our preconceived notions of things. It's not going to work for everybody. You might be even wanting to get off your chest. What is this idiot talking about? Why is he speaking about these fantasy settings? I don't need to hear this garbage. And you need somebody unbiased in your life. Therapy can be a part of that. It doesn't have to be talking about fantasy sports. It doesn't have to be talking about real sports, but you could. You could talk about your favorite team and why they're losing games that they shouldn't. You just need to get off your chest because not everyone's going to understand that, but it does, does eat at you. It gets to you. That's a normal reaction. And therapy can be helpful in, a, in getting to the, not the root of that problem, but understanding how to process it, cope with it, deal with it, and move on to bigger things in your life. Therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us do have bigger problems in our life than our favorite sports teams, and it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and is designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit betterhelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That is betterhelp.com. H-E-L-P is the help. Betterhelp.com slash LockedOnNBA. Okay. All right. So I spoke about that part for a while. Some might say a little bit too long, but I am really passionate about this 10 plus three is a garbage setting. It's ridiculous. It leads to unbalanced leagues. It leads to decisions that you shouldn't have to make. It leads to more people being disinterested, giving up during the season. It's a stupid setting. We can argue 10. If you say, do you think 10 plus eight was too big? Some people said that and I get it. Go to 10 plus six with three, uh, two ILs or 10 plus eight with one IL, whatever. 10 plus 3 is a ridiculously small number and it just should not be the default and I think it's what probably the biggest one of the one of the biggest contributors to frustration with fantasy basketball. That's me. What about positions? Yeah, positions. 
because we know the default on Yahoo. Now, I could go on and on and on about why Yahoo has this default setting where they have two centers of the default that they've never, ever changed, and there's literally no good reason for it. None. Get rid of it. Shouldn't exist. Your first step as a commissioner on Yahoo League should be to eliminate that roster setting. If you're on ESPN, they go the other way. Yahoo says, nah, you actually, we're going to make you have centers. You've got to have centers. And ESPN goes, absolutely, just pull back. We don't actually need you to have that many centers because ESPN tells you that you can only have four centers. And then you get into the situation of are they listed with their primary position of center or their secondary position of center? And the secondary position doesn't count towards the four center max. And it's all garbage and all unnecessary. Why do we have any of those things? Yahoo goes point guard, shooting guard, guard, small forward, power forward, forward, center, center, uh, flex, flex. The center, the most replaceable and least important position in the NBA. We're going to have more of them than everyone else. Makes zero sense. So I just said, who cares? Get rid of it. Why do I even need point guard eligibility? Shooting guard eligibility. Why do I need to be a shooting guard? These things don't really happen in the NBA. You're a guard, you're a big man. You're a wing. Really? That's really realistically... People will argue about position specificities and they'll even come out and tell you, well, the team actually listed him as a point guard. When in reality, the teams don't care. The NBA makes them put guard, guard, forward, forward on the starting line, but nobody cares. Jason Tatum started a point guard in one game. Javante Green started at center for the Bulls. Like, nobody cares. We don't need these positions. I could go one step further and just say, just have a roster, yeah? It's not like the NFL where certain positions have, have certain roles and have to stand in certain spots and can do certain things and have individual stats per position. In the NBA, you're just on the court doing stuff. You don't have any special rules. You don't have anything that relates to your position at all. None. It, they don't need to be there. What I did is I changed it. And I just said, we're going to have guards. We're going to have forwards. We're going to have a center spot. We did three guards. We did three forwards. We did a center spot. And then I included a little bit of flexibility. I did a spot that was for forwards and centers. I did a spot that was for guards and centers. And then I did a utility slot. The reason I did the guard center and the forward center is that if you did want to get extra centers in, which is part of the argument sometimes people make for having, well, Yahoo's got the two centers because you can actually have a point guard and then fill up the guard slot and have two guards there, two point guards. Again, not a, not a valid argument, but people say it. So I did that. So look, if you wanted to go extra centers, you can get a center, you can get a forward center, you can get a guard center, you can get a utility. So you can actually start four centers without any other position eligibility. Now, you might say you can actually start more guards. That's true. You can start five guards overall if you wanted to. But an NBA court has two guards, theoretically two guards in one center. So having more positional eligibility or positional spots available for guards and forwards makes more sense to me than centers. So that's how I set it up. 95% of people who replied, 276, a quarter of the sample size, a quarter of the sample size said this was great. We love these looser positional eligibilities. I will never go back, I don't think, to hosting anything with the strict point guard shooting guard. It is unnecessary. And again, this is one of the things that not necessarily makes it better, but how many times have you heard in your league or you talk, hey, how, do you think he's going to get point guard eligibility? Do you think he's going to get center eligibility? He's been starting at power forward all season, but they're only listening to small forward. How many times do you hear that? There were some ridiculous examples of that this season. And I wish, honestly, off the top of my head, I wish I could remember which ones they were. But there were some crazy ones where a bloke would be listed small forward who'd started 60 games at power forward. Like, very obviously not as a small forward. Don't let your league be determined by arbitrary decisions made by somebody else. Yes, our fantasy leagues are always determined by who's performing on the court and what their numbers are and how coaches work, but like a bloke that works for Yahoo or their stat provider determining position eligibility when they get it wrong. Like jo oh, that's, that was the one. Josh Giddy didn't have point guard eligibility. He had power forward eligibility though. Okay. That's not true, but that's what they did. I think Jalen Williams didn't have power forward eligibility, but he was small forward eligible. All right. There was crazy ones of those all year. 95% approval we got on that. So I was pretty happy with that. The next one's a big one. And... Probably need a little bit more time to talk about that one. So I'll just tell you that today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. To do a lot of things in life, you've got to be a pretty competitive person. And I am. I am competitive. It's just what I do. I've got a competitive side. I want to be the best at whatever I do. And now I can be the best at Monopoly Go. 
It's been downloaded over 150 million times, so I'm sure that you have heard of it already. It's a great twist on Monopoly, where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up your amazing cities to bring you in that big money. And you can just mess around with people. You mess with your friends, you charge them rent on those iconic properties that are so well known. In Monopoly, you can rob their vaults of riches as well. And the leaderboards will show you who is the biggest Monopoly tycoon of all. But it's not just that your competitive side wants to pound them into dirt, right? You can actually team up with your friends, give them a bit of a hand up, go, hey, now that I've killed you, do you want to join the, the good side? You can do that, team up with them, battle against people from all around the world in timed tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or on Google Play. Like I said, the next one was the big one, probably the biggest thing that I did on the uh, Lockdown Fantasy Basketball Bowl, and that was the games cap. And people, I thought people would have some level of, we had a games cap the season before, but it was a little bit different, a bit of a softer cap. I thought people would have more of an issue with this. I would say that this was the absolute biggest, it wasn't the biggest winner by um, approval percentage. We got to 86% approval here. But in terms of the impact it has on completely changing the game of fantasy basketball, this is it. Now, the problem here is, is that even though they're rotisserie games on ESPN, even though they're rotisserie games on Yahoo have this technology, they don't allow you to use it for head-to-head leagues. They should, but that'll take them 20 years to wake up and realize that they should be doing something differently, Yahoo and ESPN. So at the moment, to do this, you have to run it on fan tracks, which you should. Just way better. How many times did we talk about a... Uh, why can't we add John Jujang? ESPN, he's been in the NBA two years. You might want to add him to the thing. Like, Magina Pereira was available the next day, or the same day, for the Grizzlies. He was there on fan tracks. He couldn't do it on ESPN. Couldn't do it on Yahoo either. But that's not the thing. When we're talking about these games cap, so what do I mean by games cap? There are lots of you watching who have never heard of a Roto League. You have never played a Roto League. You should. I'm going to do more Roto Leagues next season. We're going to do a whole Roto Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowl thing. Probably won't get anywhere near as many people, but we're going to do it. All it means is that you can't just stream a million blokes in. You can't sit there and go, well, look at that. I'm going to grab all the four-game blokes, add them in, and I'm going to beat my opponent with nine more games. Because to me, that doesn't determine that you're a good fantasy basketball manager. It doesn't determine that you're a good... Uh, analyzer of player skill and opportunity and all that. It doesn't tell me any of that. It tells me that you just spammed volume. You just crammed volume down your opponent's throat. And I don't think that, that is the number one indicator of how good you are. Again, people tell me that Josh, streaming is the game. Streaming's only the game because the game was set up that way. The game was set up that way and people went, oh, if I just get like seven more games and I'm going to win, yeah? And that's that was a loophole that got exploited. It just doesn't need to exist. There's no reason for it. Why do we do that? Like Again, I'll take you back to the most popular fantasy game in the world, or even the second most popular fantasy game in the world. Fantasy football or fantasy Premier League. Like That's huge. You can't go in there and go, well, fantasy football, actually, if I just add three extra running backs, I'll just get way more yards than him this week. It's easy. Fantasy Premier League, well, I'm just going to, I'll just chuck it at a couple extra strikers. They won't notice. I just started with two extra guys. That's fine. Yeah, we're good. I win. I win. No worries. You can't do it. So why do we allow it in basketball? Why? It's ridiculous. So I put in the games cap. We had 10 starters. I made it that every one of those starting positions, you could only play four games in that slot. Again, you play a roto league and the league defaults that every starting position plays 82 games. You can put whoever you want in those spots, but 82 games only for each slot. 820 games total is the default on Roto. At the end of the year, theoretically, all the teams competing and in a great league, every team in the league has played 820 games and the best team wins. So I wanted to bring that idea into head-to-head where it's 40 games for the week. That is it. You can't get the guy in who plays. The, The spud who plays four games doesn't become better than your 50th ranked player with three games, doesn't happen. Because you can't, you won't use those guys anyway. It's not about who can add the most games for the week. Well, sure, there's a talent in Maximize. Now, it's not a hard talent to figure out those. I'm going to be honest with you. 
It's not. It's so easy to do. How do I get more games? Uh, I, I count. Like, it's not hard. What this was is just very simple. You have 40 games to play, four per slot. Now, many people said, Josh, in the responses, they said, it's great, but I would have just loved 40 games for the week, not per position. And I get that. There are limitations to doing that because the way that the software works across all of, all of them is that if we had that and you played 39 games on Saturday, then what it allows you to do is then go over the limit and play all 10 guys on Sunday and you play 49 games. Again, that's a, a way that the there's a limitation in the system. There are there is a setting you can do on fan tracks, which you can't on yeah, on ESPN you can actually have this setting as well where you do set a soft games cap. Yahoo, still living in 1972, doesn't have any ability to have a games cap at all on head to head. Absolute idiocy. But there is a setting on fan tracks where you can set in that if you go over your games limit, you just get zeros for every category, which I think that punishment is just way too harsh. So I wouldn't put that in because even though it's like, yes, we can do this. We've got 40 for the week. We can use point guard seven times and shooting guard seven, whatever you want. I, I don't think that that, like, that level of punishment is correct. I don't think we should be neat. And, and I ob- obviously can't do that. Monitor 1,080 teams to make sure they're all abiding by the strict number. I can't do that. So we had four per slot. I think it worked out really well. And honestly, I was very surprised that we had 86% approval on this as well. I thought people would complain about it, and they did, but I thought more people would complain about it. Now, the problem is is that 47% of people said they had some level of difficulty um, managing the games cap. 53% said no problem. Now, I was very firmly in the no problem. I'd never run a head-to-head league with a games cap like this ever in my life. I try to empathize as much as possible. I understand some people didn't really understand it, but I never understood how there was any difficulty whatsoever with running that, with managing that. Now, that's partly on me. And when we do this next season, we'll almost definitely have the same games cap setup going. Someone else left a comment, man, Josh, I love it. I just wish you would get rid of the games cap and make it just no cap so it's all streaming. Like, bro, that is the total point of doing this. So we don't have that. It's why we did it. It's because it's to eliminate these huge problems in fantasy. So I think part of that is, is, or large part of that is on me for not explaining exactly the best way of managing your games cap. I, it would honestly take me three minutes a day. And I, I had a league in the category one, in the points one, in industry pickup, um, plus managing and monitoring all 90 divisions, plus all of the work that I do. It took no time whatsoever, none. I don't think I missed a games limit once through the entire season. I never screwed up once. To me, it was very simple. And those of you who have played on fan tracks, all it was, you look at the screen on your roster page, there was a tab that said minimum maximum and you clicked it and it showed you how many games you'd had each slot. Now, I understand that that ideally, and I am going to talk to fan tracks and see how possible this is just to get it so that on your roster spot, on your roster page, the game's max shows up without clicking the tab, which would make it way easier. So it was an extra step, which again is something I should have been able to foresee and communicate. But once again, if you've played in a Roto League, you know you just go click that, you go click your limits tab to check where you're at with everything. And that's just second nature. So that was second nature to me. It's also to me again, just some handy tips here that we'll do again when we launch the bowl in August, September. Is that, okay, ideally, your 10 best players play four games for the week. There's your 40 done. Your bench guys, they sit there in case of emergency. Some weeks, your third best guy might only play three games. So then you have to use one of your bench players. But it's not not super difficult to work out. Well, these I've actually got 11 really good players here and I'd be more than happy to use them. And these other guys, they're sort of just sitting there just in case. So you go ahead, you set your roster, you put your good guys into the spots you can even just go and like manually count it up. Like, how many games do I actually have accounted for here? Oh, I've got 42. That's okay. You bank the games in early because you never know when injuries are going to hit. And then at the end of the week, you might have to sit somebody. And then uh, you sort of filter it down, filter it down. And then it comes to the stage where you've got, like, I've got eight spots left on a Sunday, but I've got 10 guys going. Well, my two worst guys don't play. And I get my other eight guys in. 
I just didn't find it difficult at all. The other way to do it is like by Monday, Tuesday, I should have at least filled up one game in every slot after Tuesday. Usually by Thursday, I would like to have had two games filled up in each slot, sometimes three, two to three. So then for the final three days of the week, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm either filling one game or two games in those slots, which is, again, a very easy way to do it, I think. But I do understand that people had some issues trying to manage that and get that through their head. But overall, I'm glad that people enjoyed it and thought that it did actually work. It does help to reduce. You're not just sitting there having to stream and, oh, man, an eight-game disadvantage, I've got no chance of winning. That never happened. It never happens. It is 100% the way forward. I guarantee you, unless you are, again, you're going to be sitting there going, well, that's just not how fantasy is played. You stream, you get more games in. That's how it's played. Doesn't have to be. I, again, 86% of people from this sample of the survey said that it was great and they loved it. That These are overwhelming numbers. What's next? How did we do acquisitions? Waivers. I hate free-for-all waivers. Hate them. Especially when you're running worldwide competitions. You should never have to. Yahoo, I'm looking at you. You're on the... Well, for me, this is actually fine. But like, you're on the east coast of the States. You got to stay up until 3 a.m. to make a waiver move. Got to wait for, to, for the day to tick over. I can't drop anybody, which is another ridiculous problem with Yahoo. Look, um, your guys played today. You can't drop him. Why not? Why not? 1992, what are, what are we doing? Why can't I drop him? I'm making my moves for the next day. No, you actually have to wait until the day ticks over at 3 a.m. Eastern, and then you can drop him. In. It's ridiculous waiting for these times. I'm on the, on the West Coast, Pacific time. It all ticks over at midnight. Go to bed. Free-for-all waivers shouldn't be a thing. Fab is the way to go. We had Fab across the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowl last season, and there were some. there, there are some problems. And I was trying to work out how do I fix this? How do I reduce the fab problem? Because the fab problem is is you set your bids overnight. They process whatever it is, 11 a.m., midday the next day. And then you're you're screwed. Not you're screwed. That if then you enter a situation where you've got guys getting hurt and you go, well, I'm actually like, it is Sunday now. And I'm in a position where I'm actually not going to hit my games limit. Well, you were at a slot where you couldn't actually add anybody else. There are ways to do it where you do one waiver processing and then after that, it becomes free-for-all, but then that still leads to the problem. Who's the most active? You get news at 5 p.m., Brandon Ingram's out for the season and you go, wow, I've got to rush to grab Trey Murphy. But you're the first person on your phone. That just shouldn't be how it's rewarded. Being the closest on your phone to get the notification, streaming the most games in, that shouldn't be how we determine fantasy winners. Some of us, not me, but some of us have lives that we have to do things with. So what I worked out to do, it was a little clunky for me on the back end, but I think, again, it worked pretty well two fab times. One that went, I think, at 10 a.m. Eastern, and the other one that went one hour before the first game of the night tips off. Now, I could easily make changes that make it even half an hour before, but it enabled you to look at the injury report, last-minute news, injuries, whatever come, came through, Make those ads, get them into your lineup, ready to go. Two waiver times for the day, the standard morning one and one that was an hour before game time to eliminate that problem of, well, everything happened in the morning, but now I can't grab anyone else to get in and we do it. And then you you couldn't add it and you couldn't fill your roster out or whatever you needed to. This, I think, solved the problem. Now, we only had 66% of people that approved this, so not as high as the other ones. 12% of people wanted free-for-all waivers. Couldn't have a worse system. Bad. And the other 21%, they just want a once-a-day fab. I actually, actually more relate to the guys who's like, just give me the free-for-all waivers, 12%. I don't understand why you would have fab, but go, I only want it once a day. That I don't really understand. I don't get why you wouldn't. Ideally, I'd want to do fab three times a day, maybe. Probably not. But you know, again, I think all of these moves that I sat down and thought about, I think every one of them, was a huge positive and worked really well. That There are going to be little tweaks and stuff. And the majority of people agreed. This is one where I wasn't sure how people would respond to it. Matchups. 
usually I play you head to head and we're done. Right? That's how we do it. But you need to unbalance schedules. You lead to situations where you can be in a spot where your team had an unbelievable week and your opponent had an even better week, but you were better than everybody else. And therefore you just take an L. Right, that's bad. It's not great, is it? That's luck of the draw, which is not ideal. So what I did is you take on two opponents per week, something that we've done in 30 deep for years. It's always been a consistent thing in 30 deep. Because again, in 30 deep, if you don't do that, you don't get to play every team. But I wanted to do bring that to this competition as well. And we did. 74% of people approved of that. They liked it. The common complaint against it was, it's really hard when I'm looking at my team and I need to stream for certain categories against one opponent, and then it's, that doesn't work against the other one. And I do understand that. But I also think, and hear me out on this, part of the criticism that people that play points leagues, that have the category leagues is, well, it's weird. You're not really like, it's not 100% real, like real basketball, which again, fantasy points aren't either. But so many category league matchups might just come down to, well, in this one here, it's four categories are decided either way who's going to get more steals. Or in this one, it's who's going to have the best free throw percentage. And therefore, you're just streaming in um, you know, Isaac Okoro and Chris Dunn, who wouldn't be sniffing it otherwise. Whereas if you're in a situation of against multiple opponents, you have to be a little bit more well-rounded in your team and in your waiver moves. You can still punt very heavily, but that leads a little bit more to like, again, defaulting to who's the best versus who knocked out this very specific strategy with his very specific player. So two seven-day matchups per week versus a one matchup. Again, 74% approval. I'm pretty happy with how that resulted. The draft, this one's fairly easy. The standard thing is a snake draft or an auction draft, which is like 5% of people do auction drafts. What we did is third round reversal, which if you're doing snake, should be your default, of course. On ESPN or Yahoo, you can't do that, but it should be the default. We did that through these leagues, 84% approved. Not really sure why you wouldn't approve it, but I do get the argument that if you're in a 12-team league, that maybe that leads a little bit to favoring the teams at 12 and 11. I understand people saying that. I think they're completely wrong, but I understand people saying that. Because still the top end of the draft, and it's going to be even more so this year, gets the big advantage. Think about who's going to be at the top. Like, you might be picking at four, and you will get one of Victor, Luca, Jokic, or Shea. And that's not even including um, Embiid. It's not even including... Um, who's the other guy that I'm trying... Who, who am I missing? Someone... Um, Giannis. You're not even including that. Halliburton. Like, we're at five or six. These guys are available. Seven. Like, there are still going to be value. But auction is the way to go. We are going to find a way... Auction takes two and a half times longer than a snake as well. And with the expanded rosters, it'll take forever. But we're going to try and do more auction. But if you can't do an auction, you want a third round reversal, 84% approval. So I know this show's gone on a long time and I don't really know why. <laughs> like, Scott, I'm being overly verbose. And I didn't do a show yesterday, so maybe I'm just uh, like an addict. Like, you got any more of those fantasy shows? Um, what are some new ideas? Hear me out. Hear me out. You have heard me talk. Maybe never. Maybe it's the first time you watch this show and you've made it 40 minutes ago. What is this idiot talking about? If so, you're a new double banger. But otherwise, you've heard me talk a lot about small sample sizes. You've heard me talk a lot about... That's what SSS is on that screen. You've heard me talk a lot about low-volume stats, about how a steal and a block, and then to a smaller extent, threes, and free throw percentage, they are small sample size events that there can be unbelievably whack variants. Herb Jones, I can't wait to dig into his numbers. But I reckon there were weeks when he had 12 steals and weeks when he had one. And when you're trying to plan out a team to build this, like, yeah, when we talk about fantasy rankings, when fantasy started, when we talk about the value and the rank of a player, we look at their season averages or totals, however incorrect you want to be. But you look at those numbers and you go, well, he did this and this and this. When in the reality, 85, 95% of us playing fantasy are playing a weekly weekly matchup, head-to-head matchup scenario where it's what happens in this one week. And there you get unbelievably gigantic variants, which can be also a way that can piss people off. 
of the best team all year. And I got dicked because Herb Jones got zero steals for the week. I'm just going to keep using Herb there. Or I got dicked because Herb's teammate, CJ McCollum, decided he was going to block four shots in three games. Out of nowhere. These are, like, so you can average 1.2 steals above average for steals. 0.9 steals actually considered a negative in fantasy for steals. That's over a course of a season. Over the course of the week, they are nonsense numbers. They mean nothing. They're so small. It's one play. One play is 110 possessions in an NBA game. It's one play. And it changes the whole week. And it's easy enough to project them over 82 games. But doing it over one game is impossible. It's impossible. So small sample size is a problem. Three-game sample is a problem. That's what's happening in a week. Each player's got a three-game sample. It's just, it's small, man. It's not great. So how do you fix it? I haven't, again, I, I don't think this is revolutionizing anything, but I, I haven't fully gotten through it all. But what I think we should, we have, again, we sit here, we are a very calendrically based, we love ordinality. Look up those words, it'll give you something to do. We are a calendrically based society. We love a week. It starts on Monday. It finishes on Sunday. That week is the most important thing. It doesn't matter that the Tuesday to Monday is seven days. It doesn't matter that Wednesday to Tuesday is seven days. They don't matter. They're not important. What did you do in this week? This matchup, which goes Monday to Sunday, that is all that matters, and everything resets again because we said it does. Yes? There's always got to be something that cuts off at some point. But we are so obsessed with those things that... That's what it leads to. But why does fantasy have to be a one-week matchup? The NBA is not a one-week league. Oh, it's week two. I guess it's it's Lakers week. We play the Lakers this week. Week three, oh, it's on the Warriors. We prepare for the Warriors. We hate the Warriors. You're my mate who goes for the Warriors. I go for the Lakers. I'm not talking to you this week. That's not how the NBA works. We don't do it that way in the NBA. We go every second night, every single day of the year. There are games on, or every single day of the season, bar like three. But we still stick to a week. Why though? Why couldn't we have... Again, this will be impossible for most of you to take. And I'm not even sure I can take it. But I do think it fixes problems. Why does the matchup just go for three weeks? Why does it need to go for one week? Why don't we have 9, 10, 11 matchups from a single player? Again, spreading stuff out a little bit. And still having... We, we change the games. We don't have 40. We make it 120 or whatever it is. But why can't a matchup go for three weeks? Why can't we use 10-game sample sizes of these players to smooth out some of this stuff? Why? This, uh, the only reason is, is because we love a calendar. And you might say, well, you never get to play every opponent. Well, that's where it comes in now. We don't have to play one opponent per week. Why can't we just play three opponents per week over three weeks? Like you would in a regular fantasy situation over the first three weeks of the season I would play John I would play Mario and I would play Lisa weeks one two and three in this situation week one two and three I would play John I would play Mario I would play Lisa I would just play them all for three weeks sit on it marinate through it think about it think about it But I don't, yeah, I think that that can help eliminate some of the small sample size stuff where blocks, threes, steals, and free throw percentage where the average attempts is like three in a game. Like that's what the average attempt is in a fantasy league, three per player. It's small as, and so many things can change it. We expand that out, rewards talent and skill more than luck. And I think that's a good thing. And that leads to more matchups. So how would that work in the playoffs, I hear you ask? Well, it's a really good question. It's not that good, but it's sort of good. What I would reckon we do, what I reckon we do, is we just do the same thing. Now, however many teams you have in the playoffs, I don't care. Four, six, like the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Bowl, we had 120 in the final matchup, which was weird, but yeah, what happened? In the playoffs, why couldn't you just do a three-week playoff matchup Let's say the top six teams make it, or the top four, whatever, and we play each other. I play John, I play Mario, I play Lisa in the playoffs. 
for three weeks. And whoever comes out with the best record at the end wins. Whoever's in a fantasy points league, whoever comes out with the most fantasy points over three weeks wins. Why not? Why couldn't we do that? Like a, It's like a best of seven NBA series. Why couldn't we do that? I think we could. And I think it would make things better. How many of you, me, how many of you got into situations, me, where you were great during the regular season and then had bad luck in the playoffs? Industry pickup. I finished first by 12 games. Knocked out in the semifinals by Mitch Casey. Locked on fantasy basketball category league. Second. All season, regular season, lost in the semifinals. Locked on Fantasy Basketball Bowl Points League, second all season. Actually did get into the bowl of that one and finished 25th, but didn't win it all. Like, I had, pretty good, I had really good regular season, but playoffs weren't very good. But you talk about, like, we want to reward the regular season. Well, it could be a different thing, like giving a prize for the regular season winner. This is a way that eliminates some of that single game variance, single week variance that plagues fantasy playoffs a lot. So we, that's what we talk about. Like, do you reward the regular season? So if you finish on top, well, the top two in the regular season get the same payout as the guy who wins the overall playoffs. I'm not the biggest fan of that, but I see the merit behind it. I see the merit behind it. But if you also be like, oh, I'm the best team for 18 weeks, also, Play Roto as well. Like That's what that whole thing is. That's how that works. But I, I think that having the structural setup that I've got there, I, I think works. I haven't tried it, and I would definitely try it in a league next year, but not wholesale. The larger benches and the IR, like that's what I said earlier. The 18 roster spots plus three IR, maybe too many. Maybe if we do the 18 or the eight bench, we don't have anything more than one IR because in the end your bench is serving as an extended IR anyway because you don't need to use the reason you need IR in a 10 plus 3 is that your bench isn't your bench it's literally active slots but if you have 10 plus 8 then there are guys that you do not have to use each week that you can actually sit there who are injured so maybe we maybe we can revisit that idea the other problem is, is that when you play on Yahoo how many times did you message or tweet at Yahoo, fan, customer care, whatever. Hey, why isn't this guy IL eligible? Again, never use IL, always IL+. Plus. But how many times did you do that or hear of someone doing it? Because it was burning up a roster spot on your on your team and you needed that because the bench is garbage and it's basically an active roster spot. So having the larger benches with or without IL is another way around that. And the other thing is just going to be more auction leagues. We're going to have to do more. I don't think... I've heard people talk about, well, I think we're going to have to ban Wimbenyama from fantasy leagues. Absolutely, under no circumstance, am I doing that. We always reassess. If in two years' time, the man's averaging 50 points and 10 blocks a game, I'll go, well, maybe we need to look at something a little bit the Wemby rule here, right? Maybe. But at this point, thinking about that now is insane, and I would never do it. But we always know that auction leagues are more fair, so let's just do more of them anyway. It's a perfect opportunity. If you're worried about the strength of Wemby next season, do more auction leagues. Because then someone will beat him up. He'll go for 100 bucks, And then the real Stars and Scrubs comes out and then it becomes really tough. Now, all of that was redraft stuff. What about for Dynasty Leagues? I'm not going to cover this in depth, but I'm going to cover it slightly because I just think it's, it's just a quick Dynasty tease, a primer. Because if you're here at this part of the year, what are you going to do? Well, you can start a Dynasty League. You can. You can start it right now if you want. You can do your draft, and then you can do your rookie draft when um, the draft happens. But there are a few things you need to know about a dynasty league if you're going to start one up now, just to get involved in fantasy all through the year. Like I said, 572 players played a game in the NBA this season. You cannot run a dynasty league that is a real fair income dynasty league that has like 150 guys rostered. I had multiple people Tell me, man, Josh, I'm in a dynasty league. Should I be stashing a man Thompson? Like, what are you actually talking about? There should be under no circumstance any sort of dynasty league that has that sort of... Because basically, you're running redraft at that point, And then there'll be people who start stashing rookies leading to this gigantic chasm, Giggity, in terms of the 
top teams and the bottom teams because you can't do both. You either have to stash the young players or you have to be trying to scrounge out value by you know, prioritizing Bobby Portis in that sort of a format. It doesn't work. It leads to big gaps, it leads to unhappiness, and it leads to league disbandment. Your league, and I originally used to be 250, it's got to be 300 players deep minimum. I might even say 400, to be honest. It's got to be minimum 300 players deep in a dynasty league. How you want to spread out your starters and bench is up to you, but you always want to have more bench than starters, I think, or at least equal. You don't want 20 starters, 10 bench, 20 starters, 5 bench. Because then you're just having to play or guess like who's going to get the five extra minutes off the bench. Is it going to be Muhammad Gay or is it going to be AJ Griffin? You don't want to have to guess that. So you might have 10 starters and 20 bench in a 10-team league, 300 minute roster. Totally fine. You need to decide when you're starting a dynasty league whether you're having uh, any sort of penalty for keeping players. Now, usually in a dynasty league, you don't. There is no penalty. You just keep everybody. No penalty whatsoever. If your dynasty league starts with an auction, well, then you can start to have some discussions. But the problem or the tricky part with that is, is that each new year when the rookies come in, how do you assign them? How do they get like distributed through that auction? Does it then just revert to snake every year? Is, are there inflation penalties of keeping you under a salary cap with your auction guys where you buy Victor for 100 bucks and then you've got a $200 salary cap at all times, but then he goes up to 103 the year after, 105? Like Those things you need to decide. Also, when you're making rules, you need to make a rule in your rules that the commissioner and maybe a committee can only institute a new rule if it gets instituted with at least one season's notice, unless there is a full majority or not even majority, literally unanimous, unanimity, that's not the right word. You've got a unanimous, everybody agrees this rule needs to come in right now. But you need to put that part in. The new rules to be entered need at least one year to plan out. Because you can't be like, Oh yeah, by the way, now guys, um, actually we're only keeping five players. So huh, good luck. You can't do that. You Or you've got a league where you keep 10 out of 12 and then you can't just say, um, yeah, you got your keepers, but we're just actually expanding it. There's two more now. You go, well, I would have made different moves during the season. You've got to give at least a season to let new rules marinate. And you got to write that into your rules. I've talked already about the auction, the salary cap, but now, how you want to approach that, but rookie drafts are a must. And again, if your league is sitting as a dice league, and say, for example, you were deciding in your rookie draft between Chet and Victor Wemanyama, well, your league is set up incorrectly because Chet Holmgren was not a rookie for dynasty purposes. Chet Holmgren was drafted at number one or number two, probably number one, with Paulo Banquero the year before. And then he sits on your bench, and that is how dynasty works. He doesn't just float around the waiver wire and then you put him back into the draft the next year. It doesn't work that way. You also need to work out penalties for tanking, how you stop tanking. The way that I think you stop it is flattened, not completely flat, but flattened lottery odds. You've got to do a draft lottery. You flatten them out and you also make it that instead of a lottery for the first three picks, you make it for, you know, let's say 10 teams don't make the playoffs or whatever. You make it so that the lottery goes for eight teams. So that if you're first in the lottery odds, you can actually fall to ninth. So you don't have any level of guarantee of getting the top pick or second pick or third pick. Then you get like disaster modes. There are other things you can do, but that's not really the purview of what we're doing here. And it's also important to note that a dice league is different from a keeper league. A keeper league, if you keep two players, three players, it's just a redraft league. If you keep five players, it's just a redraft league. Like honestly, it is. In those situations, I, there's very, very rare circumstances where I'm going, well, this guy's actually like, the 170th best player, but I'm keeping five and I think he might... No, no, I, no way I care about that. None at all. They, those leagues are just redraft leagues with a spicy twist. That will bring us... Again, we'll do more on Dynasty throughout the offseason. Let's talk about the play-in. We've got games tomorrow. The Western Conference play-in games. So let's talk about who they are. The Lakers and the Pelicans. Pelicans 7, Lakers 8. The loser is not out. The winner gets the 7 seed and gets to take on the Nuggets. The loser 
has to play the winner of the other game. I think that if I was the Lakers, if I had big enough balls, and I don't, my testicles are very, very small. But if I did have very big balls, I would lose this game and then win the next one so I can take on the Thunder. Because I don't want to take on the Nuggets in round one. I You will not beat them. But the risk is there you don't make the playoffs at all. So, you know, me and my puny testicles would just be like, let's try and win. I think the Lakers will beat the Pelicans. Not because we just saw it, but we've seen it many, many times this season of AD and LeBron giving real problems to the Pelicans. Now, Ingram's going to play more minutes in this one, but I think the Lakers go into New Orleans, and I think that I love, I like the Pelicans. I think they're really good. I think it's just a shocking matchup for them. And I would have picked them against almost anybody else. But I will take the Lakers over the Pelicans. So the Lakers into the seven, and then the Pelicans waiting for the next game, which is between the Warriors and the Kings. Now, this is in Sacramento. Golden State travels up there, much like the first round series last season. Both of these teams going backwards from last season. I thought that was fairly obvious. I thought Sacramento had a really bad offseason. Um, it played out exactly like that. And they, they had four players still this season, Sacramento, in the top 45 of total minutes played. That is an unbelievable run of injury like this season. Again, not as big as last season, but that is ridiculously good. The problem is the, they made no improvements and they actually actively got worse. In saying that, I actually do think they beat the Warriors. I just, yeah. The Warriors have been bad all year. Steph has been forced into way worse situations. He's still good. He's not as good. And maybe it gives me one last opportunity to do this. Wiggins has sucked. Clay has sucked. Chris Paul has been a shell of himself. Draymond's been in and out. I just don't... The Warriors, I picked them to beat the Kings last year. I think the Kings knocked them off here. But if it plays out this way, I think the Pelicans will smash the Kings in the, in the final game to get the eighth seed. But I'm not going to give my prediction on that just yet. So I think the Lakers beat the Pelicans, and I think the Kings beat the Warriors in the 9-10. And because I missed yesterday's show, I've decided to go as long as possible here. What an idiot I am. In the Eastern Conference, one of the worst matchups you'll ever see is happening in this one, but let's do, go 7-8 and eight first. Philadelphia, Miami. Um, March MVP legend Jimmy Butler up against the return of Joel Embiid. I I think the Sixers might actually kill him. I yeah I I don't think Miami is good. I know that Miami went to the finals last season. They also lost the first playing game last season, and they like the Kings got actively worse in the off season, and they have played worse in the regular season. I think that the Sixers win this pretty comfortably, and then they get to take on the Knicks. And I don't know what happens there. That is going to be a, the the Sixers are legitimately a two seed in the plane. That's the value of that team, the quality of that team. I think they win, but I could be wrong. The next game is possibly the worst game you'll ever see. Do not watch a second of this one if you can. It is going to be the Hawks and the Bulls. The Hawks, they have no rotation players. Like Jalen Johnson is not going to be available and Yekra Kongwu is not going to be available. Their seventh man is Vit Krejci. He's not going to be available because they didn't convert his two-way contract. They could have. They could have just converted it. He didn't even have to agree to it. They could just convert him so he's available to play. They didn't do it. They do not care. So, uh, what uh, is Muhammad Gay literally going to play in this game? And then on the other side, the Bulls, do they have a center? No, they didn't convert old mate Adama Sonogo. I don't think Drummond's going to be there. It's going to be Vooch, who is actively a bad player. The thing is here is that, like, it's going to be, it's what can Trey Young do? And how does Caruso slow him down versus who the hell stops DeMar DeRozan? And I don't, I'm not a massive DeRozan fan, but nobody can stop him on this team. They've got nobody. So I think the Bulls, to justify how good they've been this season, will win this game and then get trucked in the next one. Which would be, that's a rematch, isn't it? Bulls heat, which is how I've got it playing out. Um, Yeah, I think, the, I think the Bulls will beat the Hawks. The Hawks, I don't really know what's going on with their team. And I think the Bulls will get smacked by either the Heat or the Sixers in that one. And that's the end of a show that just went too long. <laughs> Guys, um, we're back. We're back in the saddle. And there's going to be more shows coming this week. So I do look forward to talking to you then. If you are still here, tell me what did you notice different about this show? Apart from it going too long. Drop that down in the comments. You know what to do. You double bang. You subscribe. You give a thumbs up. All of that stuff is great in helping out the show. Guys, we are done here. Off season starts now. Thank you so much for listening, everyone.
So yeah.